Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, I pray that as we uh, look further into your word, that you would uh, continue to encourage and strengthen us, that you would bless us, that you would teach us, and that you would uh, challenge us. And Lord, I pray that any area in our lives that need to be dealt with, I pray that you would deal with them, that we'd find freedom from whatever is entangling us, and we'd find all that we need in Christ. Lord, help us to love as you called us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may use the bulletin or the Info Central insert, if you so choose, to help you follow along with the sermon. Well, in the study of theology, when you come upon the doctrine of humanity or the study of humanity, included within that doctrine is the doctrine or study of sin. And sin is described as separation from God. It's sin is unable to measure up. It results in death. Words like trespass, unrighteousness, iniquity are used to define sin. Sin is likened to missing the mark, irreligion, rebellion, treachery, perversion, and abomination. Typically, sin is inauthentic, unreal, not genuine. There is no truth in sin. Truth and sin are far apart. But what is also interesting is that sin is associated with words like restlessness and agitation. Restlessness and agitation. Sin and peace are like truth and sin. There is no peace in sin. Agitation and restlessness are words that are associated with how uh, the sinner brings disorder to himself and to others around him. It describes how sinners live in chaotic confusion. Sin brings disorder. It's interesting that the word Torah, which is the name of the first five books of the Bible... Genesis through Deuteronomy, means order. Torah brings order. It is the word of God that chases and removes agitation and restlessness away. It removes chaos and it challenges it. In the book of Psalm, the writer said, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He is like a tree planted by a stream of water. And then it talks about the wicked. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Do you gather the restlessness and agitation there described in that verse? About the like a tumbleweed just being blown about. No order, no direction, no stability, no certainty, no hope, and no future. The word wicked in the Hebrew language is related to the Arabic word which means to loose. And when you loosen something, like on a brick wall, you bring instability and destroy it. Sin and peace are far apart. In Isaiah 57, we read these words. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There is no peace for sinners. The word tumultuous is similar to what we have read here. Tumultuous is never at rest, always looking over your shoulder, never knowing when you will get caught, like the word paranoid. In Proverbs 28.1, we hear these words. The wicked man flees, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Hell itself carries this idea of tumultuous agitation. In Matthew 13, Jesus, talking about hell, said, Throw them into the, into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The idea of gnashing of teeth. Like, so that constant agitation and restlessness. No peace. In Revelations 20, the Lord Jesus I will throw the devil into the lake of fire where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is what sin brings. No peace, no freedom, no liberty, no truth, no salvation, no hope, and no life. It is a constant strangulation, a constant dying, a constant failure, a constant and never-ending foreboding restlessness. The Bible says, For all have sinned, And fall short of the glory of God. 
It also says, for the wages of sin is death. In Ephesians, we read, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Our hope cannot be found in our efforts, our drive, our intelligence, our own manufactured brilliance. We cannot overcome the basic thing that is killing us and removing our peace. We cannot overcome it. But Christ is our hope. Christ is our peace. Even though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Although we are sinners, you and I can be made righteous. We can be made at peace. Even though death is our destination, salvation is provided, life is given, and hope is secure because Christ Jesus is Lord. Sin provides no peace, but Christ offers peace. Interestingly, in the 18th century, a Frenchman named Jean-Jacques Rousseau burst on the, onto the intellectual scene. He won instant notoriety when he wrote an essay. And in his essay, he argued that the progress of civilization had not, benefic- had not been beneficial to mankind, to human beings, but rather harmful. He argued that people are naturally loving, virtuous, and selfless, and that is society with its artificial rules and conventions that make them envious, hypocritical, and competitive. He he concluded that individuals must be free to create themselves by their own choices, free to discover their own identity, free to follow their own road. He wanted reformers to set people free from the chains of institutions, rules, customs, and traditions. He defined freedom as the state. The state was the liberator, and it was the family the church, class, and local community that stood against the state. Interestingly, he said, by destroying all social ties. And when he said social ties, he's talking about family, marriage, the church. All social ties. The state would release the individual from loyalty to anything itself. itself. Each person would be independent from his fellow man and absolutely dependent on the state. It's interesting that this philosophy revealed itself in some of the most horrific and oppressive regimes of the 20th century. Under Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, even Pol Pot, the Cambodian dictator who killed a third of his country in Cambodia in the late 70s. It was this philosophy that helped to spawn the French Revolution in the latter part of the uh, 1700s where 17,000 Frenchmen and women were killed within a year. The tragedy of attempting to create freedom that exists only in the minds of philosophers apart from God only leads to our ruin. There is no peace. There is no righteousness. There is no freedom. There is no salvation in our own manufactured peace. It's all found in Christ. French satirist Anatoly France. It's interesting. He has a last name named after his country. Anatoly France. Once observed... That never have so many been murdered in the name of, do- of, the do- of a doctrine as in the name of the principle that human beings are naturally good. Isn't that interesting? There is no peace apart from Christ. Our hope rests in him. I challenge you today. No peace. No true peace. No real pre- peace. No Christ. As we near the end of this study in the book of Philippians. We have been reminded of the beauty of the Christ life, the humble attitude, and how that has been lived out through Paul, especially as he sits in prison awaiting his trial, awaiting his hearing before the Emperor Nero, who is not the most sane man. His mind, though, Paul's mind is on the Philippian church and the other churches. That he has that he's planted, he's, he's praying for them, he's caring for them, he's thinking about them, he's prayed for them. He's rejoiced over them, he's suffered, and he's suffered at the same time for them. But Paul has known the mind of Christ and the calling to serve in the world that, that demands. But one thing that has stood out for Paul, one thing that has become abundantly clear to him is this. The church has the message that will rescue 
and does rescue and can rescue humanity, mankind, from its false and imaginative utopia. The church, because of Christ, because it is the body of Christ, can bring humanity to the knowledge and salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is where God will change the world. It is the church that will bring the message of Jesus to our culture and our community. That is why Paul fought so diligently and so emphatically in challenging the churches to obey and live for Jesus. For through them, to live to the, as Christ lives through them, the message of Jesus is heard. And he challenged them to live in unity and humility to see that the enemy is out there, not here. <laughs> the church cannot mimic the world. We are to mimic Christ. We do not mimic the world. We expose it for what it is. I ask you, are you ready for the challenge to live the life of Christ so we can expose the world and rescue humanity from the false hope it creates? Are you ready? I hope you are. To do that, you need to know peace, to know truth, and to know Christ. First thing here that we look at in your notes there, number one, peace begins with Christ, not you. Peace begins with Christ, not you. Let's look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Referring to chapter 3, when he says, that is how you should stand firm. Verse 2, I plead with Judea and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. The famous hymn that we sang earlier, It Is Well With My Soul, was written because of a terrible tragedy. And maybe you've heard the story. A guy by the name of Horatio Spafford, who lived in the 19th century, was a businessman in Chicago. He sent his wife and three daughters to Europe by ship while he remained back in the States, intending to join them later. En route, there was a terrible storm. There was a shipwreck, and the three daughters were drowned. Mrs. Spafford made it out to safety and wired back, saying, All of our daughters have been lost. Only I have been saved. He took the next vessel. As they came near to the place where his daughters had drowned, the skipper of the ship informed him of the place and says, This is the place where the ship ship went down. It was there on the deck of the ship where he wrote these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Peace is not a natural virtue. Peace is not a natural product. We do not create peace. We are given peace. Christ is our peace. We attempt to pursue peace, not, but we do not end up with peace. (laughs) If we pursue it on our own efforts, that is because peace begins with Christ, not us. First observation, from love flows peace. Paul, as he begins this chapter, he expresses his love to this church. He has been blessed by this church. This church has served him, given to him, and even sent Epaphroditus. You can read about him in chapter 2. The church even sent Epaphroditus to this church to serve him and bless him. So Paul was, has been encouraged by this church, and because of that, he has seen Christ revealed through this church. That has blessed him so much. So he begins by saying, I love and long for you. He truly has love for this church. Then he says, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Literally, he called them my beloved brothers. My beloved, here when it says dear friends. He showed them from chapter 3 how to stand firm, which uh, chapters 1 and 2 contributed to. In chapter 3, he says, I'm straining forward. That's how you stand firm. Paul stood firm knowing his destination. His destination is heaven. 
and how he reached and strained toward the calling of Christ. He did not waver and he did not give in to the demands of this world. He was confident in Christ and as a result, he could strain toward what is ahead. His love for the brethren was evident. He cared for this church, but he wanted them to know something about love. Love is the hallmark of following Christ. Love was fully revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 15, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Greater love. Jesus knew about his relationship with the Father, and it was secure. It was real. His, fa- his relationship with the Father was real. It was secure. It was genuine. There was no threat to that relationship. The relationship to his father was certain. So Jesus loves and Jesus loved and kept on loving. He was free to love. He loved when people spat on him, when they mocked him, when they beat at him, when they laughed at him, when they hung him on the cross. He loved. When you know your relationship with the father is secure, you too can love. That is where true freedom lies, because deep down, you know, there is something that cannot remove you from the father. That is where peace is found. That is where peace resides. Peace resides on a foundation of certainty and security, not randomness and arbitrary. Peace flows from the reality that you are loved. So you love. Peace, Paul knew as he sat in prison awaiting his his trial from a maniacal emperor. And he still had peace. He had peace deep within. The emperor could not remove the father's love from Paul. Because the love of God was secure, he wanted the Philippians to know this same kind of love. He knew from the flow of love, peace existed. He knew that love could overcome. That is why he's pleased with these two women, whomever they may be, And whatever dispute arose among them, he knew that this dispute could grow and become a problem and mar the witness of the church. It could hamper the church's ability to show the community the love and message of Jesus. It was their unity in Christ that gave glory to Christ and made the message relevant to the culture. The way in which he pleaded with these two women is that he used the word loyal yoke fellow. Interesting word in Greek. It's a a strong word of unity, though. It means yoked together, paired, united, wedded, like a marriage. It's a strong unity word. It means friend. He calls the church, my genuine friends. He showed them that his love for them was real as the love of God was real. He reminded the women and the entire church that they were wedded together. They were yoked together. And because of that, they were called to peace to settle whatever conflict arose. And the same is true for us. If there are disputes, if there are conflicts, we're to be reminded. We are genuine friends yoked together for the cause of Christ. It rests in knowing that you are loved and that love is genuine. It is real. It is secure. So you can love when love is even not returned to you. You can love because the love flows from the abundance of God. Love flows and peace happens. So no peace, my friends. Second observation, your destination is certain. Paul knew the church carried the message of Jesus But he also knew that the nature of the church rested in the people living the Christ life. And division and bitterness could make the church irrelevant if we are not careful. So he reminded them not only that they were united, but their destination was real. Their hope was certain. He said, whose names are are in the book of life. The importance of what Paul is saying takes us back to verse 20 of chapter 3, where he says, Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. In Philippi, 
the people in Philippi were considered Roman citizens. They belonged to Rome, even though they were hundreds of miles away from Rome. They belonged because their names were written in a registry that said, these are citizens. In the same way is true for the Philippian church. They may have lived in Philippi, but they belonged to heaven. Their names were written in the book of life, in the registry. In the Old Testament, genealogies were secured by having them written down to show that a family was legitimate and genuine. The same is true here. Our names are written down and we are heirs of God. Our name is under Christ. We belong. Your name is written. It is known. In Luke 10, the Lord Jesus said to the disciples, However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You belong. John the Revelator uh, said this, If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. He also wrote, Nothing impure will enter heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You belong. You are a citizen of heaven. The writing of the name means you're a citizen. You belong. When you know your destination is secure, it is real, it is certain, will peace be revealed through you. So no peace, my friends. Second point, peace comes from a heart of worship. Let's take a look at verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In Ken Sandy's book, The Peacemaker, he writes, God delights to make his children instruments of peace and reconciliation in the midst of conflict. In this world is conflict, and God, through his Holy Spirit, wants you to know peace and to distribute peace. God loves peace. He is called the God of peace. If you look in verse 9, the God of peace. Peace is the blessing we are given as we follow him. In Psalm 34, we read, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. We are called to pursue peace. Christ is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah. Jesus promised to give us peace. In John 14, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. They're members of the family when you're called the sons of God. In Ephesians 2, Paul wrote about Christ. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We are at war with God as sinners. But through Christ, he has brought us together. And we have peace in him. In Romans 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus has brought us to the Father. And because of that, we have peace. The war is over with God. The hatred has been removed. And now love lives within us. We are now in the presence of God, celebrating, not cursing, His great name. Building on what Paul had said in chapter uh, 3, he reminded the believers of their unity and their destination. He showed them that love is the foundation with which the Christ life is lived. He pleaded with them to be at peace because Christ, who loved without limit, called them to do the same. Then he said, because your love is secure, because your destination is certain, rejoice. First observation, from peace flows joy. It flows joy. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. There's never a time not to rejoice, for God is always God. 
Worship is our response to the God who loves us so much, who has given us peace. Previously, I had said that worship is to be our first response. For when we worship, we recognize that God is God in all situations. In the book of Second Chronicles, Jehoshaphat is king of Judah. And there's two kingdoms at this time. There's been a separation, southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. The southern kingdoms, Judah's kings, are the, from the line of David. One day, King Jehoshaphat is, maybe it's the morning time, reading Jerusalem Times, having his cup of coffee, I don't know. But he's outside enjoying the morning air when some messengers come to him and said, A vast army made up of two countries from the north are coming to attack you. This nation, this small nation. It was a large army. The nation of Judah was sure to be defeated. The numbers alone proved it. Jehoshaphat knew that his chance of victory was slim, but he also knew his God. In fact, he knew his history. He knew that God intervened. God cared and God revealed himself specifically to Judah and the Jewish people. In chapter 17, Jehoshaphat was committed to God. He actually sent people to go out into the, uh, into the country to hear the word of God. He trained up people to hear God's word. And because of that, the fear of the Lord fell upon all of the people and even the surrounding kingdoms. Now, Jehoshaphat even had a strong army. He had roughly a million fighting men ready for battle. But it's interesting that when Jehoshaphat hears the words that this vast army is coming to attack him, what's the first thing he does? Does he go over to his army and say, I got enough men. Does he find peace in the strength of his men? No, instead he fasts and prays. He knows where his true strength lies. He prays. After he prays, the spirit of the Lord came upon a man named Zechariah who said, This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Then he said, You will not even have to fight this battle. You have to show up, but you don't have to fight. As the day arrives, Jehoshaphat assembles his army. But when he does, he puts some men in the front of the army that you normally wouldn't put. You know who he put? He put worshipers. He put men who would sing and praise worship to God. He put worshipers in the front line of his army. And the worshiping men led the army. As a result, the enemy was routed and Jehoshaphat's army did not raise a sword or shoot a bow. The army that attacked Judah fought itself. Worship in God, worship to God, worship celebrating God defeats the enemy. Worship must be our first response because it puts God in his place exalted. It puts me in my place on my knees and it puts the enemy in his place defeated. From worship comes peace, from peace comes joy. So no peace. Paul, as he's writing this letter, reminds the Philippian church to rejoice, to worship, to exalt God. And from that, you recognize a few things here in verse seven. He says, rejoice. First, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That word gentleness means meekness and meekness. Sometimes we think of a wimp or something like that. But rather meekness is strength subdued or submitted unto God. We are submitted unto God. That makes us meek. You belong to him. Secondly, you recognize that the Lord is near. Verse 5 says, the Lord is near. That is why you worship. Worship brings you to know the presence of God, and God's presence is near. Third, then you pray about everything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. Anxiety robs you of joy and makes you focus on you. Anxiety keeps your mind on earthly things and puts confidence in the flesh. When Jehoshaphat heard about the vast army, he understood the implications, the carnage that was about to happen. What was his first response? He prayed. He went to the people and he prayed. From that prayer, he worshiped. First observation, from prayer flows worship. Paul used three words there. It says prayer, supplication, or petition with thanksgiving. The word prayer can mean to praise, to adore, to, to worship. 
You begin with praise. You begin with worship. Then you place your requests to God. After you worship, then you say, God, here is my requests. You acknowledge who you are in light of who God is. It's interesting in the book of James that we read these words. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You see, their request probably didn't begin with worship. It began with selfishness. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 37, Trust in the Lord, do good. Dwell in the land, enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Notice that word delight. Trust, your, trust in the Lord. These are phrases of worship. Then God gives you the delight, desires of your heart when you worship. As you pray, as you worship, then you ask, you are thankful. You are thankful that God has given and provided and blessed. As you pray, requesting and in thanksgiving, the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. Wiersbe, Warren Wiersbe in his commentary sees chapter 1 as having a single mind, which we worship. In chapter 2, we have a submissive mind, so we request to God. In chapter 3, we have a spiritual mind, so we're thankful. And in chapter 4, we have a secure mind, so we have peace. You see, when you worship, you know what we talked about earlier. You know something deep within that God's love is secure and you belong to him. When you know that, you have peace. And when you have peace, you love and worship. A quiet confidence invade your heart, and you're at rest. You know, in the book of Daniel, there's a very interesting story there about Daniel and the lion's den. Remember that story? Only You could only pray to the king. And so what does Daniel do? He goes to his room when he hears you can only pray to the king. That's the new law. You can only pray to the king. Can't pray to anyone else. What does he do? He goes to his room. Windows open. He doesn't care. He prays to God openly and willingly. And then what does he do? He goes to sleep, and he rests knowing who his God is. I challenge you, no peace. Number three, peace pursues excellence. Let's look at verses eight and nine. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Albert Camus, I think is as you say his name, also another French philosopher, a lot of French people here today, I guess. <laughs> he was a French philosopher of the 20th century, argued if God is dead, which Fred, uh, Nietzsche had said earlier in the century, he says this, then there is only one truly serious philosophical problem, that is suicide. Judging whether life is, is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. In the 1970, this movie came out, which called, was called MASH. You ever remember the movie MASH? Not a good movie. <laughs> the theme song, you know what the name of the theme song is? Suicide is Painless. Now, the, the, the song was written as a joke, primarily. But in the second line, the second verse of the song, it goes like this. The game of life is hard to play. I'm going to lose it anyway. The losing card I'll someday lay, so this is all I have to say. Suicide is painless. If God is dead, then there's nothing left but what? Death? Your destination is secure in death? That is the hope we're left with when you remove God is death? It's interesting that after all these hundreds of years of the Enlightenment, of this naturalistic thinking. All these years where science has been deemed the only solution to mankind's problem, where reason has sat glorified and praised. This is what we're left with is death? This is the solution that we're given? You know, in the past 150 years, we've seen amazing things done in, the, in technology, in science, medicine, and literature. We have seen wonderful advancements, but we're still sinners, still empty, still dying. Our intelligence, our science can only take us so far. Christ is our hope. But I have a different message. I have the message of the Lord Jesus where death does not get the final say. In the world of science and technology, it's interesting. There's a program called SETI. 
search for extraterrestrial intelligence. What are we looking for? I tell you, we're looking for answers. We're looking for hope. We're looking for help. We're looking for salvation. We're looking for what Christ has already shown us. But we're not willing willing to accept it. We're looking for what Christ has already promised, a home in heaven, life, purpose, direction, salvation from our own sophomoric acts. We will continue to discover, invent, and innovate, and we should. But we will not discover peace in the microscopes, in science, in literature, in philosophy, or in the stars. We find it in Christ. Our peace is Christ, so no peace. First observation, right thinking flows from peace. You know, Paul said, your mind will be guarded by the peace of God of Christ in verse 7 that, that, that transcends all understanding. That's amazing. That's where that quiet confidence comes in. That's when you say, my peace is secure because my love is secure. Therefore, I can have peace when things may be falling apart. It transcends understanding. But Paul said, your mind will be guarded. In verse 5 of chapter 2, he said, think like Christ. In Romans 12, he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In 2 Corinthians 10, he wrote, take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. In Ephesians, he wrote to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. You see, our minds can be controlled by the sinful nature. It directs our hearts and oppresses our actions. We are unable to control our minds. Yet when we pursue Christ, we pursue a holy lifestyle, a mind that is submitted to Christ. A mind that is set free from the sinful nature. Our minds can be wholly corrupt. In the Old Testament, the word heart and mind are used interchangeably. In Jeremiah, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It is beyond cure. The mind stands opposed to God's word and God's love. Yet when you worship, you are renewing your mind. When you are intentional in loving others, you are renewing your mind. When you focus on Christ, you are renewing your mind. When you pray with one another, you are renewing your mind. When you pray and the peace of God guards your heart and mind, you are renewing your mind. You seek to renew your mind to have right thinking because you have peace deep within. You know, if you look at verse 8 here, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That is peace deep within being demonstrated. As you read this list, you see that it's describing Christ. Whatever is Christ, true. Whatever is noble, Christ. Whatever is right, Christ. Whatever is pure, Christ. Whatever is lovely, Christ. Whatever is admirable, Christ. If anything is excellent, Christ. Praiseworthy, Christ. Think of such things. I challenge you, Philippians 4.8, all the things you do. <laughs> Philippians 4.8, all that you do. Before you watch a movie, before you read a book, look on the internet, visit with friends, go on vacation, react to good or bad situations, Philippians 4.8 it. If for some reason you want to pursue things that are not noble, maybe you don't want to pursue things that are noble, right, pure, or true, then you have to ask yourself, maybe I'm addicted to something. Maybe I'm in bondage to something. Maybe I'm entangled up into something. Maybe I can't break free because the desire is too great. Do you care? Does it matter? Can you stop? Are you unable? That is where the community, the church must come in and together we carry each other and we help in praying for each other and breaking free those bondages and things that entangle us, the things that are holding us addictive. Each morning when you awake, give your mind and thoughts to God. What you see, focus on Christ. If you can't stop the struggle, whether it be sexual sin, addictive behavior, any other sin that's holding you, then we have to step up to the battle and know that you cannot fight this alone. And together we can pray through it and overcome it and renew your mind. Are you ready to bring the message of Christ to this dying world? Then let's do it. Let us not waver. No peace. Let's pray. Father God, you truly are holy. Thank you so much that you love us, that you sent Christ to us. You set us free from peace, I mean, from sin, and have given us peace. 
Thank you, Lord, that you, your love is secure and that we have all that we need in you. May all that we do in our lives, all the work that we do with our hands and our feet glorify you. And may we honor you. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that is struggling because they have no peace, Father, may they find freedom in you. May we together as a community overcome the sin that entangles us and struggles and and addictive behaviors. May we say no and say, I don't want to follow this line. I don't want to follow this lies anymore. I want to follow Christ. Oh, Father, pray that if there are people here that need your healing touch, that they would not waver, but they would find it in you.